Good morning, everyone. I'd like to um, call to order the Long Range Planning Committee meeting of May the 10th, 2024. And would say that our first item this morning is a roll call, identifying voting members and recognizing new members. All right, so Alan Paul. Here. Uh, Rick Shanae, not yet. Peter Freilinger. Here. Robin Saunders. Here. Portia Hirschman. Here. Portia is now a voting member. Yes. So, and Robin is a voting <clears throat> member. So we have two new alternates, uh, Robert Odlin and Judith Fisher. Um, they are not here. And then Rachel, our planning board liaison. And here. Jean Marie Katarina. I think I'm here. Council leader. <laughs> and John, <laughs> I'm um, John let me know he would not be here. Okay. <clears throat> and I believe our voting members this morning are Peter Freelanger, Robin Saunders, Portia Hurstman, and myself. Uh, and you've recognized the new members. So item number two, review of the minutes of March the 8th of 2024. I will move to approve these. We have a second. move. We have a second, Portia. Is there any discussions? Making sure I so reach out for Robin so I don't miss her. Oh, his head looks like it's saying no. So. Nope, we're all set. I'm okay too. So we have a first and a second. Uh, with no other discussion, I'd ask for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Shanae is now here. We were just voting on the minutes. On right. March the 8th, I yes. yes to approve. <laughs> so that is, that is unanimous. Um, we, item number three today is to nominate a new transportation committee liaison. We had talked about this. Our, our uh, liaison um, was Marvin. Mm -hmm. He is no longer with us. Um, well, he's not. Well, <laughs> really. <laughs> 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 so, so okay, um, he is no longer on our committee. <clears throat> is there someone who would like to fulfill the role of uh, representing us on the transportation committee? And and it can't be it, and it can't be Portia. Is it an evening committee? It is. It's the fourth Tuesday from six thirty to eight. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I'd be happy to do it for an evening committee. Yeah. All it's right. If you like, it, if if, if uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm it's really yeah. 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 I think it's a great committee. Personally, they've I've been very sure. active and they've been doing some good stuff. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll 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 raise my hand and volunteer. Awesome. And Thank you, Peter. Variety of age groups. That's even better. Yeah, yeah. there is. Yeah. There is. Very good. Um, do we need to vote that? Or? Uh, yes, please. Yes. So uh, I will move that we uh, uh, nominate Peter to be our liaison to the Transportation Committee. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. Thank you, Robin. Robin, you had expressed an interest I don't want to forget that, but no, no. I'm good. I'm on ad hoc. I'm on uh, open space and vulnerability. So I'm good. Okay. <laughs> All right. I just, I didn't want to forget you and I didn't look up earlier. So I apologize for that. So we have a first and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none. Uh, all in favor? Say aye, raise your aye. hand. One, two, three. Do you favor of yourself? I just have to have a stand on this one. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'll show that to be unanimous as well. Thank you, Peter. You bet. And you'll send me the invites or somebody yes, else. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Angela Lynch at Town Engineer is in charge of it, and then I go to it every once in a while. Gotcha. Okay. Terrific. Item number four is review of the draft environmental standards from the Conservation Commission. And I will ask. Okay, yeah. So to introduce I us. Will, uh, oh, and we have uh, Miss Fisher is joining us too. She's our new 
Hi, Judy. Oh, awesome. Hi. So you all may recall, you saw this last fall as a framework uh, for the ordinance. It's been quite some time. Um, and now it has the numbers in it. And so this has gone to ordinance committee. It's also going to a developer forum on May 23rd. It's been to the SEDCO board just for a review, but the developer forum will be a more broader reach, I think. Just to make it clear in the ordinance, we bounced it right off. We didn't really discuss it. So just so people will know. Yeah, really yeah. Nice. so I, that's where I was going to get. It's going to go to this developer forum, um, you all, and it's going to go back to the ordinance committee before it goes into the So um, still quite a bit of opportunity for comment. What know. changed? What changed from what we had previously? So all the numbers were included. So I'll share my screen. Okay. Okay. And so now. But this is really the, the highlight of the ordinance is the setbacks. And so this little simple diagram shows you the resource and then the natural resource setback is the entire setback that's applied to each resource. The vegetated buffer is the area that's even more, it's the more protected in the whole. And then your buildable would be over here. So it follows along with the uh, numbers below in the table. So this actually got filled out before we just had holding places. Uh, but this, but this proposed um, <clears throat> ordinance is brand new. Yes, this okay. is brand okay. new. Okay, that's what yes. I want. That's what yes. I wanted to be sure I was understanding. Okay. Yes, this is brand new. Uh, we've wrapped up. I'm so excited. We've wrapped up the ordinance consolidation, but this is a new. Okay. Okay. So for wetlands, there's three different uh, natural resource setbacks proposed based on the size of the wetlands. And then the vegetated buffers are um, included as well. So you have a 25 foot setback to 100 foot setback for wetlands. This is again, applies to new um, development or redevelopment. Are these absolutes or do they be subject to their answer? Right now they are absolutes. Um, there is a placeholder for a waiver. Uh, but we don't have any defined, so that's some things that we're looking for our input on. That. If, the, if these do become subject to variances, or presumably the zoning board would be responsible for these, I think the planning board is what I'm thinking gotcha. because they're we, more because we've gotten the shoreland stuff right um, sent down to us. I think what you would down. see for these would be perhaps there's a, a, a great example recently we had. Um, a vernal pool on the rugby pitch, and there's a 250 foot buffer that the state is required, but the state will let them go in there and pull out. Um, and so we might have, we could be more stringent than the state or DEP with our rules, but we might have it written so the planning board could approve um, some encroachment, but maybe not as far as what DEP might allow. Um, so I think planning board would review these with the site plans, and so it'd be really appropriate with them. If any of this stuff does become like the shoreline, shoreline, shoreline issues um, uh, that get sent to the zoning board, I think we would appreciate training, um, sure. which we didn't get when the shoreline stuff came out and I, has thrown us off. So yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. Well, Adam, if I could just ask, clarify, just for people who want to. Um, these protections are just for new development requiring site plan or subdivision. Right. Does it apply to homeowners who currently live in these areas and want to expand or whatever? No, no. Um, they would just have to apply with the shoreland zoning if they have any the state, state the state requirements, right? Yeah. Yeah, Autumn, and uh, I could just respond about the uh, the rugby pitch. Um, what essentially we did is it needed to be a trail uh, and there had to be uh, a small encroachment on the vernal pool, but we set down um, the culvert size to ensure that the uh, <coughs> critters could pass. In other words, things, things like that. We ensured that there were measures that um, would recharge the wetlands. Uh, by where there were uh, where there were stone walls, that there were areas where they, I 
can't remember the exact term with critter crossing. Well, we had the critter <laughs> crossing, yeah. Uh, basically, where uh, there's possible drainage back into the into the wetland. So there's a lot of things that Return. that we did using that ability to uh, to kind of guide what the <clears throat> approach the the minimal nature of the encroachment and the least possible damage by that encroachment. Um, so vernal pool is uh, 250 foot, and then the natural resource that back is 100% of that. And this is the state recommendation um, for vernal pools. The coastal bluff. Uh, does, what does HAT mean? Highest astronomical tide. Got it. Thank you. So the coastal bluffs, uh, unstable or mapped and stable. We don't actually have very many of these. Um, these are the setbacks for them. So it's the highest astronomical tide plus four feet up or 100 feet. It's whichever one is bigger. Rivers, streams, or brooks. The natural resource is proposed at 100 feet and then the dedicated up at 75 feet. And then the marsh migration zone is really, um, it matches. This is an interesting one because I think when we get through with this, some of this is actually going to roll into shoreland zoning mm -hmm. for review purposes. It's easier all together like this. Um, but when it comes down to actually making it work with our ordinances, the marsh migration zone will be part of the shoreland and this matches. So we'll actually be, it's probably too weedy, but we'll actually be adjusting the use table in shoreland zoning for marsh migration. But this is a really good way to simplify it to capture input. Well, do you know why? Because uh, stream, I think it's streams also, but I know it's definitely works. It's state is 75 foot mm -hmm. setback. So they're making this. They propose that this be greater. I was just going to indicate that HAT is a great TLA. <laughs> <laughs> Um, should we somewhere in this document spell that out? Oh, it is. This is just an excerpt. The actual ordinance has definitions. Okay. So, yeah. I just went through this uh, this little excerpt for the purposes of this, but the whole ordinance is also attached. But this, I think, is the bulk of it. So, um, these are the setbacks, and then this is the <coughs> list of activities that is permitted or not permitted in the different areas. And so something that's new, pesticides permitted, they're not permitted in any of these setbacks. Fertilizer is permitted only in the area outside of the vegetative buffer. So these are some, some of these follow along with the existing permitted uses in shoreland zoning. Um, some of them are much So I think um, once we do the developer forum, we'll get some more input. We've also created a mapping tool that I think is really cool to use that maybe you all might want to take a look at in your spare time. But you can. It has all of these buffers on play with, um, you can see where Shoreland Zoning is. There we go. Um, but you can see the, and this is, there's some asterisks with this because there are some assumptions for undeveloped parcels that would be affected by wetlands. But like the red is the undeveloped parcels that have wetlands. They may have a little bit of effect or the entire piece, but this gives you an idea let me turn that one off and just see. This is on the. Um, <clears throat> this is um, on our ordinance consolidation page for environmental standards. Okay. And it's also in the uh, What's Happening page. So there's a couple different ways to get to it on our website. So I would urge you to kind of go out there and. 
play with it and see. You might <clears throat> zoom into an area you know. It's easier for me to go into a particular area and go, I know this site, what's happening? And then you can see what these buffers would do. This does not um, prohibit fill of wetlands. So you can still fill wetlands. You can still um, pay or fill and mitigate, but it would still have a buffer requirement for whatever you did fill. Um, on the map, is there a more um, uh, defined or text of what each of those those areas mean? Um, no, so, okay. not on the map. I, we should, yeah, maybe we should meant to follow up better for that. That's a good right. point. So it's really clear. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I would ask you if you go through the map and you see something like this doesn't make any sense, um, <laughs> give me that feedback so we can update that. Yeah. Any other questions about this? I used to um, be a healthy beaches volunteer. Uh -huh. And we used to see a lot of um, fertilizer bloom in Ferry Beach anytime we had a big weather event. Mm -hmm. Is this going to start addressing some of that stuff that comes down? Because you've got the confluence of the two river brooks, whatever you want to call them, right there. And boy, it would just it would throw the members way off. I don't think so because I think you're probably seeing a lot of that with homeowners. Yeah, okay. So this would be for you know new development that it would and and that's why I preface it with we really need to look at shoreland zoning too. Yeah. But this is a different exercise to sort of get it started. Uh, but I don't I don't think so. Okay, that's a the reason for adding out for prohibiting outdoor lighting is it the actual establishment of the pool in it or no, no it's the impact on the okay. um, critters and just okay. the environmental effects of it there's actually uh, I'm not scientifically going to answer this right but it has to do with their habitats being okay. disrupted and mating and you know just birding and being able to come to a place that changes the normal that makes sense. Yeah. Bottom, are we going to talk about um, the site plan review ordinance under A, the site utilization and layout? I've got some problems with that in terms of applying the ordinance. The structures and impervious areas shall be designed around and away from resource areas such as wetlands, steep slopes, water bodies, and other unique natural features. Um, Rachel, let me share my screen and get us all to the same. Yeah. Screen. What page are you on? Three are you five. Four? No, four and five. Um, yeah, purpose. Yeah, the um, under the site utilization and layout. It, is, it says here there are no specific parameters defined, and we are really going to need those specific parameters. For instance, in the conservation subdivision, the assumption is there are going to be wetlands, and we're going to avoid them as much as possible, but in order to have any subdivision there, there's got to be oh, crossing the wetlands. Rachel, this is, I'm sorry, I'm taking a minute to get here. This is just what we have now. On four or five, this yeah. is the, the structures and impervious areas on page five of five. Mm -hmm. This underlined. If this is the regulation that we have now. And what do we have difficulty? With? And that's why I was saying. <laughs> sorry, this in this staff memo just pulls all the little pieces that we have, and it's really mm -hmm. limited, right? It's to show you that's why we want additional standards. Yeah, we we because it's not great. I agree we do need we do need more there. Yes. Uh, the other question I have, um, and this is probably an easy answer, but on page two, uh, under the permitted activity, 
uh, the very bottom, it says soil erosion and sediment control measures. And the answer is no, it's not allowed. Um, why is that a no? Because I can see times after events where we really would need to go, somebody might need to go into that area to control runoff uh, and erosion that comes from other properties after an event. So that's a good point. Oh, it's a no because you're not supposed to do anything in there. But if there is maybe that might be a waiver opportunity. Yeah, because if, if something starts coming in there in order yeah. to protect it, somebody may need to go in to put up barriers or control measures to protect to protect that area. Um, I, I would be very careful about that because that's that's making sure that construction contractors don't include that area as their uh, perimeter controls for erosion sedimentation controls. So unless I'm missing something, I think it's very careful that we don't provide a waiver there. I, like we, I think uh, we I don't think, want a silt fence in our in our protected areas. I, I think it would be very easy, well, semi easy for somebody who knows how to write the ordinance. Um, simply to say that, that under no circumstances will that area be allowed to be used for uh, sediment control measures uh, of develop, uh, arising from that, development. That site. At that site. That specific site. Yeah. Yeah. In what case would you put an erosion and sediment control inside a natural resource setback area? In the case of an accident. That would be considered emergency response. Well, in that case, a, a no is a blanket no, unless there is something that says- uh, And then that forward. would be DEP, and DEP has emergency response controls over all waters of the state and you know natural protected resources. So I, I just, I don't want us to mess with this. Sounds like I can just add another use that emergency response, and I can work with Pete Silvinsky and Angela to make sure that it's the right thing, but it gives that. <laughs> but my emergency response has to be DEP, not the contractor. We don't want the contractor okay. saying it's emergency Got it. response. Got it. Okay. Are there any other comments on any of these other? Just do you need a an action by this committee? Oh no, to just a review and input or right. gathering input at this point. At some point after you, you have developer councils and things like that, will we have a vote before we pass this back to the uh ordinance Oh no. This right. came out of conservation commission. Cool. Right. So we would bring those comments back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We'll yeah. Follow yeah. Up sure. and yeah. show us what happens. Okay. <laughs> I understand a little. Yes, this is a conservation. I have a, a question um, <clears throat> on the um, permitted uses. Uh, and what happens to runoff? If you have impervious surfaces nearby, if, what happens to the runoff and, and how do you how do you deal with that? I don't understand the question. Um, well, you have we have a list of um, things. What happens with set of setbacks? Um, what are plans for runoff into a wetland area? That's what the vegetated buffer is for. Yes. Yes. Okay. So and then the setback itself helps to protect the vegetated buffer guards it even more. And then we have um, site plan requirements to prevent that runoff as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Moving on. Moving on. Item number five this morning is to review and discuss existing parking standards. Um, all right, so this one, I just loaded you up with homework information. I hope you read everything that was attached <laughs> last month. Um, so there's a lot of information in here. This is just meant to be our first flush initial uh, conversation. I included lots of links to local uh, 
trends and then uh, what's happening in the country. Uh, we have parking standards that are very specifically based on use. And we know that we have some parking issues, especially around restaurants and cafes. <laughs> but we have too much parking in some other areas. We also um, have some issues, I think, when uses change in existing facilities. That's something that I would like to make sure we figure out how to address because you'll have a, a new building, a new, a new shopping center, uh, say, that goes in and their parking may be based on retail use say in 10 years, none of us are at the table anymore, because I'm in Italy, and we'll, um, <laughs> just putting that out there into the universe, um, in 10 years, none of us remember, and then the restaurant has a different parking, but it seems like those centers should be able to stay lively and change uses that are allowed in that zone, so I just want us to think about that too as we go through it, that's something um, to be aware of. So shared parking is important, um, figuring out how to make that work. Rachel brings up quite often a parking maximum. Like we have minimums, but do we also have maximums? Because some users want parking for the Friday before Thanksgiving or after Thanksgiving sale once a year. And so do we want to be parked for that? Um, impervious restrictions are important. You all may read recall most of our zoning districts are at 85 percent and so it's, that's pretty high and so really it's hard to decrease that unless we address parking requirements too so i, I think the big issue and and just became obvious as i looked at rockland yarma Saco, and Kogan, is that we don't have the same kind of development at all mm -hmm. as those towns we don't have a town center, you know, where you've got, where you can have a lot of changed use within a small pier, you know, within a small area. The other thing was that visible parking um, was utilized first. And unless people knew where there was alternative parking, they just kind of kept spinning around the, the block. And we're moving our parking to behind the building for the most part. So I, I'm, I'm, looking at that issue and saying, okay, if somebody drives by and they don't see any parking in front of the building and they only see two spots, two handicapped spots, for instance, in front of the building and they drive on, how do we, how do we make people aware that there are other parking facilities? Um, and the other thing that I noticed was how far people were willing to walk if it wasn't safe to walk right. to those parking spots. And the time of day, demand use um, impacted the inventory of spaces. So if you've got restaurants open at night, they utilize the same spaces as retail during the day. Right. Again, in a more concentrated urban kind of <clears throat> setting as opposed to our sprawling situation. So it was tough taking what was here. <laughs> yeah. I and applying it here. I don't know if there are any other communities that are sprawling the way we are without some kind of historical downtown area. Well, if I look at places like West, yeah. for example, <clears throat> off their main street, they have all their business front, but then along the river, so to speak, right, is where they do all their group or bulk parking. So they're sharing spaces similar to that. I mean, if, <clears throat> if I guess now I'm kind of looking forward to the downs. <laughs> where there's some kind of concentration. Where, where, yeah. where supposedly <clears throat> we will have some form of, for lack of a better term, downtown area then I would think that we would need to provide parking similarly and hopefully as planning board comes along or items get to the planning board, if we are moving our parking to the back, maybe there's some form of requirement for signage <laughs> along the main road to direct people where public parking would be. And that's kind of my point is that 
we, we have a more sprawling situation, even with the downs, but when you look at our existing development and open area, Correct. how do we then get people to go beyond the instant, well, if I only see one or two spots in their fall, I'm gonna move on kind of thing to directing people that there's more parking in the back. Right. Well, I guess I'm confused. Why are we worried about that? Of the one or two people who I don't see my spot and I, I move on. I don't care about that. Um, if but, they're if they're not that bright, but, I mean, but your business is <laughs> but your business is Mike. <laughs> but, but the businesses are incented to to inform their customers and do that. I'm not sure that as a town we have a particular responsibility to the businesses. Again, the businesses have all the incentive they need to provide direction and, and do that. My point is, if you're looking at a parking space inventory, though, how 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 are those being utilized? Well, my, my, and again, my point would be is if if we allow businesses to include in their allowable or in their in their inventory of parking, parking that's not directly attached to their building. So it's, you know, we, you have to go down a path or so, so whatever. Um, if we allow that, then the incentive already exists for them to inform their customers or have their staff use those spaces first so that the customers have maximal use of the obvious spaces. Um, I, I, yeah, again, I, I understand why signage would be good, but that's something that the businesses themselves would be incented to to, to, to provide and ensure that the developers um, include such giant signage as part of their site plan. So I'm not sure it's something that we have to mandate. Yeah, I think the problem that arises, at least in my mind, is that I do believe it is the requirement of the town to make sure that there are adequate spaces when a facility is built, right? Yep. The problem that we run into is that usage sometimes or oftentimes changes. And so now it becomes very, very difficult. And do, do you, you are put in a position if there's enough change that the planning board or the planning department has a potential business coming in that changes the use of the building? And now all of a sudden that an assessment needs to be made, is the existing parking adequate or isn't it? And then there's the whole big picture of shared parking, like Autumn was saying earlier, how you might have retail during the day, but you might have restaurant usage at nighttime. And so you have a shared parking situation, which works. But man, I would not want to be the person who has to try to figure out which space is going to be a shared space and which space isn't going to be a shared space as businesses change over time. I don't, I don't know how you can kind of get a handle on that. Yeah. I, I mean, I, and, I, yeah. And, and, yeah. Um, the, um, a couple of examples, the, the fire station development, that's based upon shared parking. Mm -hmm. We had, a, as planning board, we had no way of figuring out how shared parking worked. Right. You know, what we were told roughly uh, is that what we're going to have there is we're going to have the, roughly Rosemont Market and the Harbor Fish Market. And then in back, there was going to be um, a, a Pilates or a yoga studio and a couple of other insurance you know, yeah. relatively low use. And then the investor housing. And then that started to say, well, investor, let's assume that each apartment has one car, one at least one car, and there may be more than one car, but one car. And all of a sudden we didn't quite have enough parking. And then the answer was, well, it's, it's going to be shared um, because the markets will be closed when people are going to be coming home from work or whatever. Yeah. Except they put a pizza place place in there, <laughs> and the pizza place, the pizza restaurant, is there most of the day and into the night when people from Avesta are coming home from wherever they've been at the daytime. So we don't know yet. I think how that's how that's going to work because there is a real overlap of the time of usage. Right. So- Have we heard any complaints or have we, have we observed any 
failures with that experiment yet? We we were have heard some complaints. Okay, just, yeah, yeah and, and um I we had a little a little problem uh in the whole development with um a sort of bait and switch in that they agreed to use the town lot as over overflow parking. <coughs> and that became okay. The lot next to uh yeah. Turns out they never talked to the town. They just decided not to, to not to bother and not to use that. Uh, so people may be using it, but they have to get out to Route One to use it. Uh, so in other words, it's it, it's messy, and we're going to start to see some changes. But we don't know. I would love to see an analysis of each development. When you say shared parking. Tell me how that's going to work okay? and how that might work. Uh, for instance, in the Downs along Market Street, the corner of Market and uh, the Downs Road, um, there's going to be a restaurant there. Uh, there's going to be five, I think, or six commercial spots. We got them to agree to put up a sign before the restaurant, before you got to that, that said parking for customers of and the parking in the back. So, but I, I don't think there's actually really enough space because if a heavy duty business comes in there where people, a lot of people are coming, gonna be coming through, they're there at lunchtime when the restaurant is busy, we're gonna, I think we're gonna have a problem, but we, we have no way to, to resolve that. We've, um, uh, We've told the Downs they cannot use, they cannot count any street parking. They kept trying to count street parking. I said, no, because that's for people coming through. You cannot count on street parking. A developer does not get any money, make any money from a parking lot, unless they're charging. In other words, it's to the benefit of the developer to use every piece of land. And land that uh, was used, I was hoping would be set aside for right close to the town center parking lot. Go on. Um, so, and, and we didn't have any any guidance on how we were going to handle that. I would, in terms of maximum parking, I think if we're going to develop how that's going to be used, um, I would like to see space turnover data. In other words, at Christmas, how long do people shop and when do they leave? In other words, uh, if you've got 700 spaces, is it possible for people to go up and down the aisles and find a space no matter what? In other words, even at Christmas, the day before Christmas. Give, give us, give the planning board or ask the developers to give us some, some data that shows that they need that space beyond saying we use it other places. And by the way, we're within the 85% coverage so that we can't say no. So we find it difficult to say no. So, um, and then in terms of change of use, sometimes that's extremely subtle. And Cafe Luna is an example. Um, when Cafe Luna folks came to us when it was gonna be developed, that space was going to be a bakery uh, with some tables, a little bit of coffee, but really around breakfast and lunch, in and out, grab something. Now it's become a sort of coffee house where people come and sit. Same use, in effect, because it's still a restaurant. <coughs> but the clientele and the purpose <coughs> change. change. And, and in effect, kind of a minor change, but by going from a, an in and out bakery to uh, more of a coffee house, people are coming and four people come in four different cars and all of a sudden, you know, we have a problem. So I don't know how to handle that sort of a change of use, but I think for the sake of the phone lines at the town center and the, into the planning department, um, that's something we need to wrestle with. Yeah, Rick. Doesn't a change of use require if the project had a site plan, say as an office? Mm -hmm. 
and then I buy that building and I'm going to convert it to apartments. So doesn't that require a trip back to the planning board? It does. It does. Site plan and parking would be looked at. The, the Cafe Luna, they have the right parking for our our restaurant and drinking establishment parking is wrong. We need to fix that one. The rest of them, I think, are pretty close. I mean, I'm just gonna be honest planner here, okay? Like, let's fix restaurants because we don't have enough, like none such didn't get enough parking. Like if you look at this, uh, let me share my screen so the people yeah. But we're um, talking about process per se. We're talking about how many parking spaces yeah. are particular uses. So restaurants and drinking and establishments, they they require um, one per two employees plus one per four seats, one per two counter of our seats, and one per 60 square foot of waiting area. It's really cumbersome. So I am counting outdoor seats at Cafe Luna. I'm like, how many chairs do you have? Oh no, take two away. That's too much. Um, now, if you look across this, this is just a sample I did. Uh, this is probably almost two years old now, but uh, Saco has a one per 75 square feet and like none such brewery would be at 132 spaces instead of Scarborough requiring 55 spaces. 132 is probably maybe a little too much, but Gorham is one per 100 square feet, it's 80. It's kind of in line with what it probably should be. But Bitterford to South Portland would yield 44 spaces. Exactly. But so, they also have a different layout for it's, it's more other places urban to park mm -hmm. and situation. So. Well, yes and no. You know, Scarborough or South Portland has a more concentrated area. And then it also has all the areas around the mall and things like that. But you can oh, I understand. I'm just saying in terms of the total mm -hmm. number of parking spaces. Mm -hmm. But these just, I think these give you an example yeah. of what we can maybe pick and choose from. Uh, for we know that there, we know our restaurants are a problem. And maybe those coffee house uh, cafes, there's maybe there's a couple of different uses and a couple of different requirements. Now that sort of goes in the face of what's happening nationally where we're like parking standards. Yeah. We want development, right? So it is a but if we had right and safe ways to access Luna by bicycle and pedestrian, mm -hmm. more people would walk and have park their bikes there. So we've got kind of a chicken and the egg. It's situation, all the things right? happening at all. It's I don't want to get locked into Luna, but part of the problem there is actual parking lot design. There is physically no place to turn. I mean. I thought our standards. Yes, had, yes, there is, but they striped it. They did not stripe it. There's a hammerhead. He left a hammerhead for them to turn yeah. around, and they made it okay. into two parking spaces. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. So I mean, I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Cafe Luna presents another opportunity. So you have cabinets to go. You have Big Twenty Cafe Luna, right? So cabinets to go really minimal usage during the day for parking employees and some quick B20 only probably in the evenings or league day, you know, certain times. So shared access um, is a really good opportunity to have curb cuts in between those businesses. So there's, it's not all about getting on Route 1, going out, coming back in, it's in between. And so that's a different thing outside of parking, but requiring shared points of access between development. So Route 1, some of it's newer, but a lot of it's going to be redeveloped. And it's probably important as we redevelop sites to provide connections between points. And so there's other ways to get in and out. Um, the Evergreen Credit Union down uh, closer to Dunstan, we required a potential for that mobile Corner. If that ever gets redeveloped, there is a spot. There's going to be a fence and shrubbery there now, but it's taken two panels of fencing out and opening it up, and then it's a connection. Does that connect into the um, lot of the um, uh, next place? There's a potential for that too that they're actually trying to work on. So that's gotcha. just okay. kind of forward yeah. thinking, like, okay, right now it doesn't work, but if we let, if we require you to design it so it could happen in the future, that's mm -hmm. something to think about. Like Cafe Luna, perhaps making them 
not have parking next to the cabinet shop and requiring a point of access would have been just a way to think about site plan development. So that's a side note to parking. So there's some, some site layout things to do to prevent and maybe assist with redevelopment projects and for new, and then probably some parking table work tweaks to do. Do we need to have one standard or can we maybe think of something like the town and village zones having a different standard to encourage densification yeah. and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think so too. Yeah, okay. I, I I, think I, that to me is one area that I didn't see come out directly in this material, but I'd like to yeah. see, um, give some thought to. Well, and that's, you know, Scarborough is really unique in that area. Like yeah. the Oak Hill area, there's parking all over the place and you can technically walk from Walgreens to the hardware store to the liquor store yeah. and so on. Now, do people do it? I don't know. Uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah, but you could, right? Yeah, so, so um, well, again, we don't have sidewalks on both sides of the, of the road and crossing, you can cross it okay, or <clears throat> Gorham Road, uh, kind of, <laughs> if you're quick. Yeah, if you run. Yeah. Um, but the crossings are difficult. So mm -hmm. if you're going to cross the street, that's a challenge. But yeah, yeah. once you're there. Yeah. And, and, and if the layout were a little bit better or the sidewalks were better, you could actually walk all through that back to the McDonald's. And, and then if you... It's not laid out so that you can do it, but you can do it. And I've done that before. Um, but certainly within the Oak Hill strip mall around there, yeah, I'd park at the liquor store, go to Walgreens right. first, go to Pace. Right. And, and that out. was the, hopefully the piece about the, um, the retirement center off yeah. of Dolphin. Like exactly. To be able yeah. to access mm -hmm. that strip mm -hmm. center and go to the grocery store and the pharmacy. And the post office. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And um, so and that's what I'm thinking. Like that, that area is right for a town and village designation and then put in stand place standards that would work yeah and, no and, i agree and that, yeah. that gets to my point that i was making is, yeah is when you can consolidate a variety of uses mm -hmm. then your parking begins to be appropriate yeah. exactly you're now looking at the benefit of war or the benefit standard or the some point standard for that area even though the rest of the town probably does need something that's more or expensive yeah. so what some cities have done they'll create parking districts and so there's and so you might have different requirements yeah. so we could really match Scarborough in that way yeah. um remember that in, in the comprehensive plan when we were talking about things like the evolution of Dunstan and the evolution mm -hmm. of Oak Hill that we didn't use that concept of, that's kind of the town and village concept we would have different rules mm -hmm. and I think one of the rules that we didn't maybe explicitly mention we certainly put in Photographs and, mm -hmm. and some graphic comments that we had was that parking would look different. In this parking would not be the same as building something along with one on one of the old construction. Right. Building, so. And that's where we ended up with architecture too, is that we yeah. were going to do these different areas of town individually. And it could be that maybe for the sake of this exercise, we fix a little, a few things, and then we yeah. visit parking by each district, neighborhood, zone, whatever you want to call yeah. it. Yeah. Um, because there are a lot of characters in Scarborough. There's a lot of different areas. Um, I, keep, I keep thinking of Freeport, because mm -hmm. I spend some time in Freeport at an art gallery where I display. Uh -huh. And it's very interesting because I can pull into the back of the church, and it's an old church, the Meeting House Arts Center. Um, and there's all sorts of different people park, and it's all behind. But then you go up and you walk on the village. People always walk and walk and walk and down Main Street, whatever. And then even L.L. Bean's parking, even though it's massive, you don't know it. Right. It's, it's broken tough. up and it's got trees and it looks really nice. But it's easy to walk. And okay. that's the point. That's, the, that's exactly right. the point. And it's if very easy walkable. To walk, it's if very easy to walk walkable. and feel safe. You yeah. Yeah. walk. Yeah. <clears throat> thing. We probably don't feel it right now, but there are lots of little pockets that once the sidewalks get put in, it will feel easier to make those types of uh, uh, connections via walking. We just need to make the sidewalks. I will say, um, GP Cog is doing a project and vision, re envision Route 1, and it's all the way from Arundel to uh, up north, Falmouth area. And they're working with all the communities to create sort of a consistent. Maybe this is not throughout the whole thing, but this is an area that's a village and this is an area. So I think we could tack on to some of that. If you guys were to pick an area of town that we should do a neighborhood or a village plan first, um, where would it be? I kind of say Oak Hill. 
the, or, so yeah, Oak Hill would be fine. Or TBC or well, or I, Oak Hill. we would just we would have to define yeah, I, an area. I, but... I, I think that's one of the questions. Do you have a separate overlay for a parking district, or do you utilize or rezone to that zoning zone map to the parking district? I don't know. Well, I'm just, I'm talking like big picture. Yeah. Let's get into the architecture and the design and all that. Where would be the top priority at this point? I would personally say Oak Hill. I, I would I would agree with Oak Hill just because you've got a whole variety of new housing going in right in this area. You've got the town center, you've got the library, you've got, I mean, there's a lot here. If people could walk or bike um, safely and feel that, okay, I can park, you know, down behind whatever here and walk and, and get where I'm going, they would do it. But right now you're forcing people to get in the car and figure mm. out how to get some growth. Even for the multifamily developments that's gone down there, you still feel like you need to get into a car right. yes, instead right. of walking on a pathway. You exactly. shouldn't be able to walk on a pathway to Hannaford, but you can't. Exactly, can. right. You know what drives me foolish, it's Jean Marie speaking, is when I go by um, Pin Oaks and the school buses mm -hmm. are disgorging tons of kids who could walk to school. It's like, hello. But we don't encourage walking, and I get it. Some of it's traffic, but so we we'll cross and drive it. I mean, this is, you know, I used to walk backwards to school in the snow in the old days, yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I used but, to walk up both ways. Well, both yeah. ways. Yeah. I don't know, but whatever, but it does. And, and I, I still don't understand. I mean, I get it, but in a, in a perfect world, it would be great to have a couple of pedestrian bridges over. Route one, I, and I'm, I know part of it was caused, part of it's like, oh, how are you going to maintain in the winter? And I don't know, but we need to be creative yep. with this area up here. Even yeah. the municipal campus, mm -hmm. I mean, walking, if you want to walk from, you know, town hall to the library, you feel like you're just walking through a you're giant parking lot. lot. Yes. Yes. Whereas, yes. you know, what's the right path? What is there? You know, more landscaping or you know things that can guide people. Benches for people to sit on. Yes, yes. Street, street, street furniture. That hill. They did add football. those. Have you seen the benches that have been? Yes, there? and I was yeah. thrilled to see those because I walked there. For However, I'm still long. waiting for the bike yeah. racks here. <laughs> and a bench out right in front of the here. Where is it? town hall. Where it's is supposed it? to be. Oh, there's, there's two benches from yeah. all. They're no, benches, but they're, they're benches, here. But like you know, in the morning when people are waiting in the car, there's no place for people to sit. People don't bike. I don't mind. Bottom of submission. Gosh, I just wanted to have a good conversation. This first one is just to sort of have a brainstorm. The mission is we can um, approach it in a bunch of different ways, so we can tweak the parking for a few things. We can add a few things. We can push on doing our Oak Hill master plan. I mean, we can go a lot of different directions. So, speaking from a development perspective, any reputable developer that builds a project is going to include on these parking. The thinking is, what do I need for parking for my customers? Mm -hmm. The tug always comes, but the town says you need whatever, 200 parking spaces. Mm -hmm. And the developer says, that's crazy. I don't need 200 spaces. Yeah. I figured out what I need. I, I wonder whether we ought to be moving towards a situation where we don't necessarily mandate parking, but we require the developer to justify the parking they are proposing within some range. Or right. something. Because I, I remember when we, uh, when I was on the board, the uh, higher place down the street, Oh, so Sullivan tax. Yeah, they, the parking they were that was required under the standards was whatever X. And they said we don't need X. We don't have people coming and parking all day. What we ended up doing there was they they provided an area for it, mm -hmm. but they didn't actually pay. Me. They they made it you know grass. And yeah. There was there was it was solid underneath. It yeah. could su support like a fire truck or something. But there wasn't this big expanse of parking. But that's the problem from a developer's perspective. Developers want parking. They just don't want it more parking than is necessary. And the Christmas shopping, you have to live with that. I mean, you can't provide parking that for the maximum because 
I'm going to look at the Cabela's product. And way too much hard mm -hmm. for what most of the uses, except maybe at Christmas. And it gets pretty busy. Mm -hmm. No, it's not um, that. Yeah. Well, and my point is, I wonder whether we ought to be moving away from requiring a minimum number of parking spaces and developing more of a range, range. and developer, you come in and convince the planning group that this is all we think we need. And, I mean, the Luna, I don't know much about that other than I hear everybody say, it reminds me of Yogi Bear, where it's too crowded, nobody goes there. Yeah. Anything, but I, 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 <laughs> what I think you, um, what I think you might want to work on or ask staff to work on is effectively a two problem approach, which is one is um, thinking about um, the minimum slash maximum number of parking spaces in the way that Rick's, Rick's talking about. Think, and that's for the general application of parking standards across the town. And then think about this construct of districts in certain specific locations in town where there's an emerging sort of urban center or emerging common center approach. Um, and um, so that, and, and I think we said our starting point would be Oak Hill for that one. And then I think you're right. There's a separate track on, on what you're talking about, Rick, that, that we're now more thinking about what's along Route 1, what's along the Gorm Road, et cetera, like that. Um, that, uh, that is a different exercise. So it feels like we have two exercises. Just so that people know, there was a note from yeah. Robin that came up and it disappeared and people didn't see it. But she basically said something along the lines of shared parking doesn't work. Um, and it's hard to enforce. It, it, shared parking does work, uh, but it, it's impossible to inform, enforce. So I'm wondering if there's a way that the town can review shared parking agreements or require a shared parking agreement by the developer and or property man, property owner who inherits it that, you know, they have to meet with their, you know, tenants once a year and understand what their parking needs are. I also made a note that, um, I like Rick's idea of having um, a range and um, the developer propose the parking, but it should be done by a traffic engineer. And does the town have any clawback? Does the town have any clawback for that hammerhead that got turned into two parking spots? Oh yeah, I have lots of stuff. Okay. <laughs> we just want to figure out a solution. Just wanted to point you out it. Yeah. Yeah, um, but I think there's some um, information that we can also take a look at in terms of demographics and like if you look at what's happening on the downs versus the rest of the town, the downs number of cars per unit is about half a car less. Mm -hmm. So there's fewer cars there. So I think there's some dynamics in the marketplace that are happening. And we know that because we actually had um, the town staff pull all of the registrations so we looked at the relationship between registrations and housing units. Uh, Karen, Karen, what was that reduced parking based on? A certain density or? Uh, I'm sorry, I was, talking about, I was talking about actual car ownership, how many cars per household. Um, and that's what's changing a little bit these days. Well, reality re as opposed to requirement. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, I mean, a lot of people, you know, I think if you live in a certain area and if there were two adults, you could probably share a car if yeah. you could bike to work or you work from home exactly. and you could get to the market. On the weekends when you want to go places, you can use one car. It's not happening in Scarborough, sorry. <laughs> it just no, doesn't. Well, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Robin, the, 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 the downs, we are observing that to occur. And, and I think if we look at what could happen at Oak Hill with more multifamily usage and more interconnected spaces, you could see the same trend at, at Oak Hill. So that's what we want to encourage. Absolutely, but it's not happening down Black Point. It's not happening. Oh, no, 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 no. It's not happening it's west of the turnpike. That's why I think the whole time check, please. Yes. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Uh, we have one more item on our agenda. I want to make sure that we get uh, item number six which is the review of a public request to consider oh, right. rural yeah. farming uses. Oh. I want to at least get into that today. So Autumn, would you please give us an update on that? So we got a request um, for a particular farm uh, that has an existing ice cream shop. Mm -hmm. 
found rural farming, but the way our rural farming requirements, you can do farm stands and you can do an agricultural store, but you have to show proceeds from the revenue from 50% or more of the actual farm. So in this particular instance, um, the farm is being sold. Someone wanted to take over the ownership of the ice cream shop that's not related to the farm, but rural farming doesn't allow that. So in essence, rural farming, and we talked about rural farming a few months ago, we had a request to look at agricultural or uh, landscape uses in rural farming area. So this is just another idea. And, and I wanna talk about it on a broader base. This is a really good specific example of, this seems silly a little bit because it exists, it, but unfortunately it can't continue in this manner. Um, there is a couple of ways to do it if you, it depends on ownership. And I think we've probably figured out a way to make it work for this summer with current ownership and lease agreements and whatnot. Um, but moving forward, thinking about protecting farmland and keeping people, uh, keeping people's farms viable, we've had several requests come in for just kind of outside of the box, different things. We'd like to keep our land, but we can't make money on it unless we sell it yeah. for two homes uh, or a home venues, for two acres. And wedding venues and special yeah. events. And so looking at those sorts of options, should we look at adding some uses to the rural farming district that folks could use? If they had a, this would not be a rural farming, I have one house on and one, you know, two acres. This would be bigger pieces of land, but out, allowing some flexibility for those families to keep those farms together. Is that something you all are interested in? Um, this is a specific request and a fix that could happen, um, but, but I think it's a it, fixing this would apply mm -hmm. townwide. But I think there's some other things to think about too uh, in that district because most of the west of the turnpike is outside of a little light industrial pocket and a running hill pocket. It's all rural farm, yeah. um, and so redevelopment certainly could occur out there. It's limited with our rate of growth ordinance, uh, but right now, sprawl is what's allowed. Uh, so is there a downside to opening up some of this? I'm sure there could be maybe some neighbors. You would definitely want to put in a neighbor notification. Um, where I've been in other places we've done things called specific use permits mm -hmm. and it's it's for lack of a, it's like a baby contract zone with no uh, no public benefit but it's a specific use that's come to the town that's a request for this one user this one spot and that may be a way to approach it where you can really look at this one request there's flexibility but it takes into consideration the location the neighbors that sort of thing um, and you can put a time and you can put a time limit it doesn't on it. work and there's no ways way. for it to go away if it doesn't work exactly um so just put it out there the thing about this situation is it's been used as an ice cream stand mm -hmm. like forever well not forever <laughs> yeah now seems all of a like, sudden it's like, like because the property is transferred ownership all of a sudden, all the cards are up in the air again, and it's like to me, it sounds. I thought it was absolutely ridiculous. I'm like, what? It's been there's no way to ask for an exception, right. or right. it's all local people involved. Yeah, yeah it's, right. it's yeah. pretty. But it's yeah, I know it is it's what it is, is, and it's. Um, well, so I, I am surprised. Um, first off, this this happens a lot on the zoning. Or where a property transfers, right. um, and we've got they've, they've got a re up on their special exception, special lease exception. Those are usually pretty straightforward. You know, they they, they either are we're going to do the same thing we used to do, or we're actually going to convert it into a tire store. So it's like no, we're not going to let you do that. Um, but it's it, this one is I'm surprised this doesn't go through the same process because this doesn't are, already have a window. Yeah, those for, are non-conforming uses and a continuation. Exactly. Or, or, or in, in the many cases, there are conforming uses that just require um, zoning board approval. So and, and we deal a lot of them with that in, in the RF district. So, yeah, I'm just surprised that this one doesn't already have 
something. The window for yeah. me to <laughs> give it a uh, oh, yeah. Brian lost that when I tried and tried yeah. and tried to figure out a way to. Yeah. What is this? Susan Crawley Ferguson is not a client of mine, but she's a really good friend. And I guess I'd like to just listen to this and not put you in. To me, this feels, I appreciate it's an existing situation, right? But it feels to me like coming to this board, it feels more like a request for spot zoning, which I <laughs> am not a favor, I'm not a fan of. Um, and so it kind of, to me, feels like it's more of a zoning board issue than it is an issue that should come to long range planning. I, I, I think if what we're saying here is we're highlighting either an ambiguity or a, a crack in the, in, in the, in the RF um, uh, zoning that unfortunately allowed this to emerge, then yeah, we should look at pat, pat, patching that up. Because I agree, I, I would expect this to come before the zoning board. I, I'm surprised this is where we would fear from the first. So, but it, it's more of a situation that it feels like even through the the uh, comprehensive planning process and oh, yeah. what we've been talking about for years in terms of trying to preserve our rural farming area, that if we do something with this that allows other usage, that we're going against that plan. Well, I I what I'm it. suggesting is that by not allowing some flexibility, right. those folks, they have nothing to do but to sell it. They'll sell. Yeah. Right. Because the land value is so high for development. And and so I, I'm like fine, trying understand. to find that sweet spot to allow a little bit of um, monetary gain on their property without selling it. I did something very similar in Texas. We own um, just a small acreage um, and I have once a month vintage barn sales. And so that was enabled me to work from home and it was really, we had a petting zoo and people came to it and it was really a great thing. We don't necessarily, you could do that on your own property, but say somebody wanted to do that on someone's farm and have a big antique market to show up. You couldn't do that because the profits are not from the farm, right? So I'm just suggesting maybe there are some venue events and different things that may be able to make their property a little more viable to stay. Or maybe you have a special event permit process. Yeah, just something, use, yeah. Uh, that, that's really all. I'm not trying yeah. to say, let's let them build retail shops or anything. It's just that sweet spot in the middle. It's just a accessory use to yeah. farming. Not it's almost like um, they're subcontractors to the mm -hmm. owner of the farm. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. we're providing a service. And if you keep it at foodstuffs or something that's agriculturally needed somewhere, right? yeah. is it know. a dairy farm? It was more of a was a dairy farm. I guess well, the, the other is. <laughs> she did a farm inventory, which was helpful, except that bees and apiaries are the same thing. I only want a little. But I guess I guess where I I. Again, yeah, asking the question if there's a downside, but I guess the other piece is if they're using main agricultural products, yeah. blueberries, milk, whatever, that were produced in Maine, to me, that is as valuable as anything. That's the local piece, whether it can, I think, right yeah, now, it has to be. be it has to be used from the farm. But again, that's I would I not, I don't want to be in the business of finding out where your blueberries came from as a planter. I just don't have to. Say. Like, can we just either say you can sell ice cream cards, right? right? Let's just, those, you know what I mean? Like, if it's a smaller it's an agricultural byproduct. What are the kind of, the, what are the lists of things that would be appropriate? And then it's really clear and it's not so funny. Um, and then and, and do something with limit the size of something. Exactly. Like, oh, yeah. 600 square feet or whatever. So it's you definitely, just a move. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and again, I'm, I'm, as I read sort of the, I normally say the appeal because this almost reads like a ZBA appeal. Mm -hmm. um, as I read this, it seems like they're proposing some minor wording changes um, mm -hmm. that would actually um, fix the crack um, mm -hmm. that, that, that they've fallen into. Um, I think what they've actually done is highlighted that we, more your point, um, Al, which is, you know, we have the RF, the, the, RF, the, um, the RF district 
um, in order to preserve farmland and in order to preserve this. And if we open up that to more general business activity, aren't we going against the spirit of why we have an RF district? Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's the real downside. That's, and, and to, to, I think you can plug that though with a, we've already got special exemptions or, 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 or special use exemptions on the, the, the zoning board has the power to approve. I think we carve out, think about carving out a new one with a lot of constraints to it. Because mm -hmm. we don't want them having, you know, Beatles ice cream palace and and water park on the, uh, that's that's clearly <laughs> the RF um, spirit. But having a little farm stand, which is exactly what's on the RF now, on the way to Pine Point Beach and, and all the rest, that that's almost something we want to preserve as part of right. the the, the character of the town character, yeah, of the, of the town as you're going down to a seven to on. on well, the, I was like the, that situation we had. Kid who does the clamming and wants yeah. to sell clams. Exactly. You know, it's from his dooryard, and it's like, yep. Well, what do you think, Robin? I actually, can you hear me? I actually really like your idea of the baby CZA. Um, I really like the idea of a use permit, but if that's too much work for you, um, I, I think it's really hard to uh, contemplate the creativity of farmers <laughs> and what they may want to bring to make money at their individual agricultural locations. To who? Do you all think you can? <laughs> <laughs> Who's talking to you? Yeah. Um, okay. So I think that that's the question too is, would it be okay if I have a farm and Karen approaches me and says, I would like to lease space on your farm to host a, an event on Fridays and Saturdays. And that's the question we're asking because I have the farm. I could do a little farm stand within some size and constraints and sell my own flowers and berries. But if Karen said, hey, I am um, a soap maker and it's amazing and your farm is beautiful. And then I have a friend that makes this candles. We'd like to set up a shop. That's what we're talking about. Because mm -hmm. right now they couldn't. Right? So what do you all think about that? And it's the subcontractor idea. Right. It's basically but limited because it's limited, be, exactly. You know, it's yeah. like the accessory use concept. So it still has to be yeah. on. Right. as long as there's some limitations and there's a review process. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I think as long as it's limited in size, limited in number of employees, limited in mm -hmm. It doesn't require additional parking. Right. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And yeah. then my question would be: Is there a role, or should there be a role for the planning board? Because all of a sudden you're hosting what's essentially a commercial gathering. Uh, should there be lighting? See, so yeah, and then you start to change. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so well, it needs that sort of thought and definition. That, that that to me though is why it's it's a very narrow exemption. You're not you know right. you have again and I'm thinking right. 500 600 square feet. You've got no more than one in, one or two outside employees. No more um you know no space shall be provided for more than three three parking spaces things like that. Right. Which we've got right now. Um we've we've been through this process. I don't remember people remember a few years ago on the um. The, the folks who wanted to put the uh, herb farm and, uh, and that over in oh god yeah that, Maple the, Lab yeah over on Maple Lab um, so we've got we we've been through the experience of knowing what we can and can't do on that one yes we have <laughs> and, and that's I think a decent model for saying okay yeah you can do that in the RS now because um, you do it in R two um, you can take the R two model and apply it to RF and it's a really tight very limited model um, but it. It allows you to have the farm concept without having the, the bleed out space to make it commercial and then you're in the planning. Um, we already have this, right? Flaherty Farm, Highland, Greenhouse. We already have this at a, a number of places. Um, Scarborough is an ag community um, and we've gotten away from that. And I think that we need to, um, I think we, we need to allow the farmers to, to live whatever, whatever, at, at whatever cost, quite frankly. Otherwise they're going to go away and then we'll have no farms. What about 
this isn't exactly a farm in my opinion, but I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, they're open most of the year. So, I mean, they do the typical, they sell Christmas trees and pumpkins and, you know, in the fall. And, but I wouldn't call it a farm. I, I've lived in that area for almost 30 years. And it's not like I've seen a plow out there. Yeah. And I'm not trying to be hard. I'm just saying, I don't think it's this committee's you know, responsibility to fix. I, I think we have a ZBA and that's well, what it's for. We are in charge of fixing ordinances and there's yeah. not an ordinance in place now that allows yeah. them to ask for this. This is an ordinance change. There's not a process to go to ZBA. Yeah, okay. That's yeah. why yeah. this would that's be why an ordinance. I wanted it here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm the one that said. Yeah, if we had a process now, we would have just gone there. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's why I say we have, we have an, um, an, uh, uh, an R2 carve out for tiny businesses. Yeah. We just don't have it apparently in place for the RF. And it seems like if we have it in place for R2. Yeah, why wouldn't you have it in RF? Well, that's, that's, that's a good question. What is immediately around? What districts are immediately around this piece of property? It's all RF. Well, and that's why I was thinking if you did the special exception or a specific use permit, you really can analyze each little area. Yeah. Is Camp but Catcher RF? Can't catch the RF, but are those, over there. there's all those condos on the other side. Yeah, of but uh, basically we're in Warbrook, I'm going to call it Warbrook Farm or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's RF. That's RF. Yeah. RF is everywhere. Well, it's for Scarborough's. Yeah. And we uh, have historically of, been a farm. Well, and we have a lot of R2 zoning that's not on R2 land. I mean, we have a lot of zoning right. that's on neighborhoods and different places. Yeah. That are not Really matching up. So ultimately, the recommendation is to short term. To I'm not sure what just short term. I I I would say we take the R two restrictive language on what you can do on our on our two property and allow it to be done on on our F property. That is really tight language. And it's proven effective at the zoning board level, but um to 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 restrict the type of development that we're trying to avoid here. Um uh. The, the question I've got though is that she, I think it's a she, yes. um, was looking for action by May 12th or something, or May. She knows that. Much. She knows. Yeah, oh, okay, got it. Because because even if we said this is a good idea and we should pass this, it still has to go through. She's sitting on the town, town council. Yeah. She knows yeah. how fast yeah. things don't work. Exactly. Yeah. She's not going to get this done for 2024. So, Robin, did you have something? Um, <clears throat> I did. Does R2 apply to like Flaherty Farm and Greenhouse uh, and Highland, Highland Greenhouse? No, that's um, RF. And let me, um, I'll look at the language and bring it back. Yes, the this particular person knows this would be in place for next summer. Hmm. Um, and we think there's a workaround for this summer that we've figured out. And maybe for next summer too, but just realizing oh. it would take some time but karen and i have talked to some other right. folks too with some similar questions so it's a bigger i think question out there i think it's a small fix and then a yeah a yeah. bigger it's discussion that needs to happen Robert, but that, those other enterprises they have been um, um, grandfathered in too he by this is coming up because of a transfer of property yes right so um those other uh, I, I don't care. I don't care. When I moved to Scarborough, it, it was a farm town, and now it's no, not. no, no. I'm saying why it's an issue today yeah. for for the zoning code, and it wouldn't yeah. apply to those. Old and I apologize for for the tone, but sorry, I'm a farm girl at heart, and you know, <laughs> farms, no farms, no food, right? No farms, no local food or local products. So, Alan, to your to your point, there's you know, there's this minor fix here, mm -hmm. but then I think there's a larger discussion. That happens under, under the umbrella of the comprehensive plan about tools and activities and um, uh, things that we can do that that will encourage and help existing and yeah. future farmers. Yeah, and I do think we need to have that cap on, which is we're trying to encourage future uses when land transfers, when mm -hmm. um, when these things, because a lot of our farms, to Robin's point, our grandfather did run a lot of their historical uses don't need to go before the zoning board or don't need to go through a review because they've already been, been here. Whereas what we want to do is that when 
a new farmer comes in, um, they have the tools that the grandfathered farmers also have. Um, yep. So we have to, I think, read the code or read the ordinance in that light, which mm -hmm. we're maybe not used to. Yeah, and the weird thing about that's very legal, huh? Weird. <laughs> the, the thing with this one is you've got it's not the farmer or the family of the farmer themselves, yeah. it's a person who would like to take over what was already there and continue that, but they're not part of the yeah. farm per se. Yeah. I, I mean, Scarborough is uh prime farmland just by nature of its geology yep. it's it, it's a it's a delta it's where all of these nutrient rich soils were deposited on the way to the scarborough marsh and to not allow farmers to come in and take advantage of that is just shooting ourselves in the foot and so i I'm, I'm, i think i'm struggling with a couple of things one thing is i don't view the property as a farm that first and foremost mm -hmm. the thing that makes me, I guess, feel better about the situation is, at least me, when I think of our ref zoning, I think of west of the turnpike. Mm -hmm. This is clearly not west of the turnpike. And it is in an area where I, there seems to be a lot of R2 type zoning, or, you know, there's a lot of residences around this area. And I, you know, between maybe some of the contract zoning issues uh, that are there, but uh, certainly approaching, I'm pretty sure this is the right spot I'm thinking about. It's it's on the corner, it says here, on the corner of Black Point Spurling. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you start going beyond it, you've got uh, Prout's Neck and everything that's going on around there. You've got residential area almost all the way up to the marsh, maybe even a little further, that's where there's condos and stuff on the but side. Are we but also talking about like getting people to be able to go to these community little pockets yeah. and villages and walk to them and bike to them? And I think this is kind of like the perfect little situation that we talk about so much. This is, say this wasn't just a ice cream shop. Now I'm just talking about what if this was your little village market yeah. that everybody that you just talked about living around could like and want to. I, I, I'm questioning whether it should be yeah. even zoned RF. Right. That's, right. that's my question. That's a, there's a lot of RF along yeah. there. I I along along on. Spurwink and, and whatever because that was the intent of the town councils over the years is to maintain that yeah. sense of rural along Spurwink, you know, going to the Prouts Neck, going to, yes, there are some pockets of development and whatever, but you've got <laughs> Ketcha, you've got Moorbrook Farm, you've got where Piper Shores was developed. That's all RF. Yeah. You've got all, tons of RF all, all got, the way down Spurwink. You've got, you've got the neighborhoods Rachel, all along oh, here, the left here's side. The yeah, I was going to say, and you've got, you know, the Rachel Carson Preserve, and you've got... So all the light green is RF. Yeah. Uh, our right down here. Folks, yeah. folks, I have a hard stop at 930. So could I take this opportunity to just talk to you a little bit about the open space ad hoc? Because this, what, what Eric just put up is perfect. Um, the ad hoc committee for open space is really talking about sort of the immense acreage that we have in Scarborough that is so rich in prime farmland and how do we try to make these portions of Scarborough accessible to, to living, the quality of living in Scarborough that we need. Um, and why is it okay for us to go, oh, it used to be farmland, but now we're gonna put developments there. And developments came in where farmland used to be. So we gotta get used to living side by side. That's how Maine works, right? You go to any lobstering community, you have lobster men living next to lawyers on piers. We've got to all work together and we've got to recognize that the natural resources that we've been provided here are worth more than their real estate value. The ecosystem services that they provide the town and the region need to be valued. And that's really what we're trying to do in the open space committee. So we're going to have a digital map and a survey and some and some feedback on conservation priorities. But, you know, as you can see, my priorities are in preserving the land that's rich for uh, farming and for other purposes. So um, 
I, I just encourage you all to really think long and hard about what our town's going to look like in 2030 if we keep going and just saying, no, residential's the way to go. Um, at some point, we have to stop serving the residential monster and serve the land. Um, may, may I say something? I come from Suffolk County, New York. And in the 1970s, I, I, I am not familiar with town of Scarborough's farmland preservation programs, but Suffolk in the 1970s developed a unique program where um, it was voluntary on the part of the farmers um, because many family, farm families wanted to keep on farming, but they had to uh, sell the land when the farmer passed away. Um, so our farmland preservation program would do two assessments. Uh, we would assess the, the farmland for its development potential and as agricultural land, two separate assessments. And then we would give the farmer the difference. And that land had to remain in agricultural use unless a special act was passed by the county legislature. Um, I don't know if this is something that you would want to consider. It's been extraordinarily effective in Suffolk. Uh, Suffolk is um, New York State's largest agricultural county. And the towns bought into it and the farmers really did. Some of these farming families uh, went back to pre-revolutionary times and they really wanted to stay in farming and this was the way to do it. Uh, we found looking at New Jersey, which gave uh, tax relief to farmers, that eventually the land became so valuable for residential use that the penalties of yeah. selling it um, yeah, were trivial compared to um, uh, were trivial for the farmers for what they could get for selling it for development. So we we purchased the development rights. And as I said, it was a voluntary program for the farmers. No, and I, I like where, where Judy's going with that. The problem we have in Maine is that we don't have a strong form of county government to support um, those types of, of farmland. Right, sort of I understand that, but what about town government? Yeah, exactly. So um, not to not to belabor the point, um, but I think there's a bigger fish here to fry. So um, whatever I can do to support that, but I actually have to log off and thank you for listening. To my editorial, I'll get off my podium now. <laughs> Bye guys. <laughs> I guess I'm gonna suggest we continue this discussion. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, and just from just from the sake continue the discussion of the broader form uh, preservation yeah. issues or I'm going to bring you back some more information. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that <laughs> no, be, I can't I'm, not I'm just looking at it. We yeah. literally have yeah. about five minutes left here. So uh, in terms of that, I wanted to make sure we got the public comment. Yes. If we have public out there, I'd like to be able to listen to what they might have to say. Yeah, uh, Denise online. Denise Hamilton. Um, yeah. Uh, Denise, can you hear us? And if you can, Denise, you're muted. Make, yeah, make sure you're not muted so we can hear you. Oh, Denise, she's, she's muted. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear us, Denise. Hopefully, you can. We're working on the Zoom settings right now. She says it won't let her on you. Ah. Uh, hmm. so yes, yeah, so is Eric. Oh, I'm right here. I'm right here, Judy. So I, okay. I mean, All right. I just like to join to look at the Zoom meeting while everything's going on in here. While they're trying to do that, Karen, any comment? Um, just the, that we are doing the developers forum on May 23rd. It's going to be at the Landry French office building starting at 745 in the morning. And I'm, I'm going to send the board, send board a 
a note yeah, about that. And it will be um, available on Zoom as well. Okay. What's the, I'm sorry, what was the date? May 23rd, starting at 745, meeting will we'll start really at 8. 745 is going to be coffee and getting everybody sitting down. I'm um, going to move on. Rick, any uh, board comments? No. Uh, Jean Marie? No, thank you for uh, taking all of these things up. And I look forward to continuing to move forward. All right. Rachel? No, no comments. Portia? No. no. We haven't had a transportation meeting for what, two months. Okay. So, Peter? The zoning board has first meeting in three months um, on Wednesday night. Pretty pretty uh, low key. Nothing to report. Okay. Uh, Judith, first of all, I want to welcome you to the committee. We, you missed that earlier on in the, in the beginning of the meeting, but we're glad to have you on board. Thank you. Look forward to working with you. Um, Thank you. I don't know if you have any additional comments that you would like to make at this point, but at each meeting, we do go around and ask if there's any board members that have comments they'd like to make. I um, really was interested in the discussion of a sort of village centered around wow. Oak Hill. And um, what would, my concern for that is, how would we make it safe for pedestrians or bicyclists to cross both Route 1 and Gorham Road? That's the million dollar question, I think. Exactly. So that's one of the biggest items that we have to try to to try to work on. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, and I don't we, think there's any it, really good answer. <laughs> we could have any traffic calming um, facility. I don't I don't know. Facilities is isn't the word, but some uh, traffic calming along the roads in in that right in that local area. Yeah. Sure. And is the is the farm um, at that intersection uh, being sold for development? No, no, it's conservation. Ah, yeah. okay. That's my understanding, anyway. That's a happy thought, right? I think it closed. Did it close yeah, it yet? May May first. I thought. Uh, last year, before the farm the farm stand closed, the uh, um, people told me that the they were still going to farm part of it, and the farm stand would remain open. The farm stand, but the ice cream shop is a bit different. So that's the well, I understand that. Yeah. 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 Any progress, Eric? Um, trying to get Denise to call, and I just gave her the meeting ID number. Uh, <laughs> I have some staff updates. Yeah. Um, so landscape went to um, town council. Council, that's right. That's the landscaper. So that's going to planning board on the 20th. And then it will go back um, to council, hopefully for second reading and official approval. And then our architecture and site layout cleanup end all be all of the commercial design standards went to ordinance last or Wednesday. Wednesday. Week. And we then, pushed it to um, council. That'll go to council for first reading at the end of June because it has to follow the landscape. So yep. that consolidation is almost done. Nice. Very exciting. For commercial. For commercial. Yeah, for commercial. <laughs> yeah, but that and was huge. Yeah. Huge. And then Portia for transportation this month, we sh we have some draft information that we'll look at. So that's exciting that's, too. Yes, it is. Yes. Um, and yeah. then uh, Robin already mentioned the open space. We had our open space steering committee kick off and it went really well. We're really pleased with the consultants we selected. I think we're going to get some really good information. The public meeting, and I'll give you more dates right now, is looking like, um, I believe it's July 25th. So we'll have an open house uh, public meeting. So I'll give you some more solid dates on that. Um, what else? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. <laughs> welcome. Right. This is welcome. Thank you. Now that I forgot what I was going to say, <laughs> hold on just a minute. I had to turn the volume down on my computer. Um, so this was regarding the rural farming and the comments made of, you know, west of the turnpike needs to be, you know, preserved as rural farming. I 
totally agree. However, it's this committee 11 years ago that created the light industrial RF overlay west of the turnpike, essentially in the future, destroying more than 100 acres of farmland. So I think that's a little contradicting here of, you know, what, you know, with the comments made, um, you know, which, you know, brings brings me to another issue that Autumn is aware of. Um, you know, however, I totally agree. West of the Turnpike, I mean, I live on Two Rod Road, Denise Hamilton. Um, you know, we're the cow path. We are all farmland, and you know, we're this is looking, you know, between long range planning and planning board, you know, this is going to turn into a mini commercial street in amongst all of our homes. And it's just not right. You know, we need to preserve this land in Scarborough and stop turning it into a small Portland, Maine. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. And if I could say something um, is having been on the town council like since forever it seems like um, one of the reasons we did do the white industrial area was because what well, she's talking about is Beach Ridge Speedway. Yeah. It used to be Beach Ridge Speedway. That's not farmland. It has been farmland since 1948 or whatever the heck it was. And one of the reasonings for doing the light industrial there was because frankly it's contaminated soils and and whatever. Um, I do know, and they and they do in that neighborhood, rightfully so, have a concern about water usage in wells and how's that going to affect because there is no public water on the west side of, of the turnpike um, or sewer. Um, so I, I mean I, and I understand the wells thing, but as far as concern that that's not going to be that was hasn't been farmland since 1940 it was a racetrack and uh i used to hear it from my house and i always knew when spring was coming <laughs> because i could hear the racetrack now all i hear is the shooting from the uh the well, scarborough yeah. range which is fine i mean i've lived with it i know it's out there but anyway i just wanted to make that point i don't want anyone who's listening in or watching to think that that's verdant farmland that was made into uh, light industrial, it wasn't. So. Okay. Any other comments? Seeing none, uh, our next meeting is scheduled for June the 14th. Hopefully we'll see you all there. Otherwise I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. We have a first and we have a second. Rick, thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Very good. Thank you very thank much, you. folks. Have a great week. Sure. So, yeah, I, I know. Please. <laughs> I know we have a meeting on the 15th. Bye, Judy. Yes. It's been confusion. Bye.